Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It is six o'clock and I'm going to call the meeting for July 20th, 2022 to order. Members of the public are invited to participate in this meeting of council by accessing the meeting, which is live streamed on our Middlesex Centre YouTube channel or by contacting the municipal clerk to receive a registration link to join the meeting being held uh, electronically. Members of the public may also attend the meeting in person at Coldstream Community Centre located at 10227 Ilderton Road in Coldstream. And although we actually have people here this evening and we are, um, this is the first time I think we have anyone in probably close to two years. So, uh, with Sorry about that. Um, in any case, just before we get to the agenda, um, I do have a few opening remarks and I'd like to recognize the residents in our community. The Middlesex County Agricultural Hall of Fame, founded in 2000, recognizes the history and tradition of agriculture in Middlesex County. The primary objective of the uh, Hall of Fame is to recognize those residents of their communities who have demonstrated unselfish achievements within the realm of agriculture and service to the rural community um, here and beyond. This year marks the 22nd induction uh, ceremony, and to date there have been almost 80 individuals recognized for their contributions. For 2022, there are nominees from across the county, and they include Craig and Moira Connell, Peter Johnson, Donald G. Waters, as well as a couple of names that you will most, most certainly recognize. Um, Sid and Jean Greenberg are, have been nominated. Uh, they're residents of Middlesex. They were residents of Middlesex uh, Center. One of the Greenberg's children, Sarah, whom they called Sari, Sari, pardon me, was born with Down syndrome. As they learned more about the syndrome, they were inspired to support families like their own, which led to the development of their charitable organization, Sari, which is an acronym also for Special Ability Writing Institute, where youths web veterans and those recovering from various injuries can access help, unique experiences and therapeutic programs. Um, we also have a second nominee from um, our community, uh, Thomas Cap Robson, uh, has roots that go back in the, had roots that went uh, back in our community for two centuries, back to 1820. And uh, his contributions are being recognized for the impact they had on the agricultural industry locally in Middlesex County and the surrounding area. In the 1950s, he introduced uh, a new type of hog to Canada, Landrace hogs. And soon after that, he started a career uh, as an auctioneer with Filson and Robson Auctions. He also partnered with three other um, others to open up the Denfield sales barn. The list of organizations he worked with and contributed is very, very long and includes junior farmers, the Agricultural Society, fire board, lions, as well as municipal roles um, as a councillor for three terms and as a deputy reeve of the former London Township. There is a ceremony that's happening here in Coldstream uh, at the community centre right where we are right now on Sunday, August 7th at one o'clock. And if you'd like tickets or further information, contact Hugh Fletcher, 519-666-1572, um, 1572 that is. Uh, the portraits of these individuals will be displayed uh, with the Middlesex Agricultural Hall of Fame inductees in the lobby of the Western Fair Agriplex. So uh, it's we have a lot of people who do a lot of good things in our community, and it's great to hear that they're being nominated um, and being recognized. There are no adjust, agenda items to be added for tonight, um, and I can ask are there disclosures? None, none being none. Nope, uh, and that is exactly what the clerk said, none were received. We also have delegations tonight. Uh, the Lower Thames Valley Conservation Authority is going to provide an update uh, presentation. We have Mr. Mark Peacock and Valerie Tosley on behalf of Lower Thames Valley Conservation Authority to present um, our update tonight. We'll just Wait a moment till we can get them to come in. Madam Mayor, can you hear me now? I can hear you, Mr. Peacock, welcome. 
Thank you. Um, it's a privilege to be here tonight, Madam Mayor, members of council. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Mark Peacock. I'm the Chief Administrative Officer, Secretary Treasurer of the Lower Thames Valley Conservation Authority. And with me today is Valerie Towsley, who is our Watershed Resource Planner. I'd also like to recognize Hugh Ertz, who is your member on our board of directors from your municipality. Um, the, uh, there, I have a presentation tonight. I'm not sure, is it being um, um, run by your staff or do I share it? Sorry, I turned mine off. Uh, if you could share yours, Mark, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Okay, I will do that. Can you see uh, the presentation on my screen? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay. So um, tonight we're gonna talk about uh, the planning agreement that uh, we're working with and um, have been working with with your staff. So um, uh, as part of the Bill 229, uh, mm -hmm. conservation authorities need to work with municipalities to form agreements with regards to certain parts of our programs that are not um, what is considered mandatory under the pro, um, program, under, under the Act. Those non-mandatory programs are, many of them are the programs that we've been working with uh, our member municipalities since 1961 when we came about. And many of these things are back, back uh, bone type programs that we provide to the municipality. So what we're looking at doing is having a bunch of uh, agreements, uh, actually two agreements, um, with the municipality. The first one is with regards to planning. So we do provide a number of services to the municipality for planning. We review uh, applications on your behalf and provide recommendations to your staff and to council with regards to the environmental impacts and um, um, things like natural uh, hazards as flooding and erosion uh, on those applications. What this agreement does is it formalizes what we currently do for you. Many of our municipalities, when we brought these agreements forward, they said, well, as long as it says what we you currently do, just keep doing what you do. And, and the, I'm afraid the answer is the province requires us to write it down and to have this agreement in place. So it, one thing it does, though, is it provides you more say in, in what we do, because we're actually spelling out all the different types of reviews and all the types of uh, elements that we provide and the timetables for doing that. It also defines report back requirements. So annually there will be reports specifically uh, regarding all the planning activities. We do that and we do present that in our annual report, but that will be more specifically provided to you. And it also formal formalizes our fee schedule. So the memorandum of understanding, what we'd like to do, uh, what we have to do is have it in place by January 1st, 2024. And you may ask, why are we bringing it forward now? Well, it's because both our board of directors and your uh, council um, work um, based on the timeframes of the elections of, uh, of the municipalities. We would like to bring it forward in, before the next election so that people that are aware of the work we do and have been working with us for the last four years can provide that input. So um, we've utilized for our base agreement an agreement that was developed by the Association of Municipalities of Ontario and Conservation Ontario um, as the basis of it. And therefore it's been vetted through many municipalities and it's been vetted through legal councils, both for the association and for Conservation Ontario. And we're using that as a going forward. What we did with this document is we, we shipped it out to neighbor, neighboring municipalities and, and uh, conservation authorities and ask them to provide input into it. So a number of people have got back to us with comments. Most of them have been positive. There have been very uh, little si significant um, revisions other than ones that relate to the specific planning of the municipality. So uh, different municipalities use different wording for different things like environmental impact studies, those types of things. And those are what we've been receiving comments back on. So um, we've received a number of comments back. One of the suggestions, and we are moving forward with it, is to do um, further work 
with the, the regions uh, or with the counties, um, Essex, Elgin and Middlesex to make sure that everything fits. Now we, um, of course, you're probably aware that the counties are not members of the authority and therefore legally don't have to sign agreements, but we are moving forward with the county level to make sure that everything we're doing and, and, um, uh, fits lockstep with the planning process and relate relationships between the county and the lower tier municipalities. We currently do it and therefore the agreements that we, are, that we have um, brought forward incorporate what we currently do, which is work with both the county and the uh, municipal layer uh, level. So we will be continuing those discussions. As I said before, even though we have to have this completed by 2024, we would really like to have these MOUs completed by November of this year. And uh, we wanna make sure that um, um, we have uh, the elected officials and the municipality uh, comfortable with what we're doing. So if this doesn't work, we will uh, work on whatever timetable works for council. So we're continuing to go through feedback and, we are, um, and we've been meeting with your municipal staff on this agreement. And now that we're in a place that we're bo both comfortable with the agreement that we've worked out, it is why we are here today. We're presenting this document to you. So we track all planning applications to um, make sure that we meet your requirements. And little, uh, I just wanted to let you know that we do this and that for the last two years, we've met every single planning uh, timetable requirement that have been asked of us. And that's um, true across the whole watershed. Now getting the specifics about the agreement there are three different types of things that generally you can break down our comments on. There is the mandatory elements, <coughs> excuse me, which is natural hazards and non-mandatory under the act, which is natural heritage and species at risk. So how does this all work out? The, um, the total levy that goes into non-mandatory program across the watershed is about $17,300. Your share is $290. And this agreement is to ensure that the $290 is acceptable to your council. The, non the, the mandatory planning, which uh, doesn't require the agreement, but we put into the agreement because we felt that the agreement should be the, for the whole planning program, that uh, everything that we do for the municipality under planning, even though we may not need an agreement for it, we felt it should be in the agreement so it is a full statement of the work that we do for you. So across the watershed, every year we do about $110,000 worth of work in planning uh, in, the, in the mandatory area of natural hazards. We generate uh, 14,300 and your share every year out of your levy that you provide us is about $2,686. And that's on average. We are um, recommending uh, to you, um, and we've uh, got approval from our board to um, have fees uh, for some of our planning services, which are not in place right now. Um, but the, and we'll, uh, I'll get Valerie to talk about that in the next part of our presentation. Madam Mayor, um, if uh, anybody would have questions on the first part, um, if with your permission, uh, I would answer them now. Perfect. I'll look to council then. Are there questions of mine? Okay, I have one quick one for you. Um, you've described the process by which you came to the amounts and, and how that's going to work forward. I'm wondering, once the MOs you, user are signed, what is the review period that you would have in place to um, revisit, say, changes? You'll have changes in your cost structure that you want to pass on or, or make um, maybe... Uh, new services that are provided or required on our side or you know, those kinds of changes happen all the time. Is there a regular review period or is it annual? Do you have to go through this every year going forward or how does that work? We would re, uh, we are hoping to have a, uh, a five-year agreement, but we would review it continually every year. Um, if anything comes up, um, then you would just, uh, we would change, do the, bring, open up the MOU and make the changes. Um, we're quite willing um, to be flexible on this. Um, this is a requirement of the province. We work well, I think, together. And um, what, uh, whatever um, enforces that uh, relationship, we will continue. So at the requirement of council or your staff, we will open up this agreement and make changes. 
Perfect, that sounds really flexible to me. So I don't see any other hands. Uh, we can move to the next part if you like. Sure, um, Valerie, are you uh, um, available to speak now? I am, thank you, through you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mark introducing, um, I'm Valerie Towsley. I have been a planner um, for the Lower Thames Valley Conservation Authority for over 30 years now. Just seems like yesterday I started this job, but here we are. <laughs> um, so as part, as part of this uh, new planning MOU, um, we actually had to generate uh, a new fee schedule. Um, we've never had one prior to this. Uh, all of our surrounding conservation authorities um, already charge fees um, for, for our similar uh, works that, that we do. Uh, in the past, our board of directors did not want to move forward with charging planning fees as they felt it um, was covered under the Section 39 grant funding that came from the province. Um, unfortunately, the province uh, cut our transfer payments once again by half, so um, we could not maintain status quo in that, uh, that uh, position. Uh, also, uh, I'm sure your staff can attest that uh, workloads have substantially increased over the, the pandemic, um, which has put a substantial strain on staff and, and getting uh, stuff out the door. Um, we looked into to see if there was any grants that could offset the cost, and we did not find any, unfortunately. Um, and we also didn't want to do any more downloading onto our member municipalities. Um, so we, we figured that a uh, user pay, similar to what other cities were doing, um, was the route that we should take. So as a result, we generated um, new fee schedules. Uh, we looked at the four surrounding CAs to us, so Essex uh, region, we looked at St. Clair, Upper Thames, and Kettle, uh, and determined that ERCA's fees um, were, um, I guess, the least uh, inhibitive. Um, so we decided to go with them. Um, they were the lowest of all the surrounding uh, CAs, so we uh, took them, modified them uh, more for our use, uh, and layout, um, you know, we it, it gives us an opportunity to, to review uh, by year and if we're meeting our costs or whether we have to take a look at the, the fee schedule again. We didn't want to go high and then have to adjust um, down. We figured we'd start low and then we'd adjust that from there up. Uh, so the fee schedule is included um, in the, the MOU um, and it's touched. Uh, very basic, very simple. Um, hopefully it's uh, clear. If, if it's not, then we can take a look at it um, and uh, change anything that uh, causes any confusion for landowners or staff. Any questions? Thank you. I'll look to council then. Are there questions? I see shaking heads. I think you've covered it, Ms. Towsley. Uh, I don't see any hands. If there, oh, I see a question, question on a face, not a hand yet. <laughs> Councillor <laughs> Cates, would you like to jump Thank in? Thank you, through you, Madam Mayor, uh, to Valerie. Um, I'm just seeing your first one, $125, legal private realtor inquiries, a fee charge for each assessment rule. If somebody asks you a question uh, about a property, you're good, you want $125? Yeah, that's that fee is actually currently existing. Um, so it is our legal inquiry or private property inquiry um, fee that we've charged for quite a few years. That's one of the only fees in planning that we've had. Um, and it's not necessarily related to the municipality. It's, it's because it's a planning related inquiry fee, it's included in this fee schedule, but not necessarily something that um, staff at at Middlesex Center will need to, um, to get on our behalf. This is something that uh, realtors and lawyers and property owners come directly to us for questions. M Madam Chair, if I may also add, we don't charge people, they just ask us questions. This is if we have to provide them a letter that they're gonna take to the bank regarding a mortgage and, uh, or uh, in, uh, insurance. So this is a formal response, this $125. 
provides a written response and a position from the authority that they can use in the sale of a house or uh, in, the, in the financing or uh, in the insurance of a house, usually. Thank you. Thanks for clarifying. Deputy Mayor Brennan? Deputy Madam Mayor to our CEO, these charges, they'll be added on um, when someone applies for uh, official plan amendment or something. The cost will go up by this amount to be covered so that we're not paying it. Yeah, through the chair, just to conclude, um, the municipalities, municipal staff have had dialogue with the students that we have five of them. So, um, we thought it was good enough to provide an overview of the uh, intent of what the amendment looks like. Um, my discussion with all the CAs is pretty consistent but when it comes to the breakdown of the schedules of the programs and, and uh, services. It will be easy for us to modify on an annual basis, and the fees will be taken into consideration as part of our. Anyone else? I see no hands. So um, I'd like to thank both of you for coming tonight and uh, preparing the presentation for our information. I appreciate uh, the answers to questions and uh, we'll look to see you the next time you have an update for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam. Thank you. Good night. Okay, uh, we can now move to the adoption of the minutes. Uh, we have two sets of minutes and the motion before us is that the minutes of the council meetings held on July 6th, 2022 and July 12th, 2022 be adopted as, a print, uh, as printed. If I could have a mover please and a second there. Uh, Deputy Mayor Brennan, Councillor Cates, all in favor? Uh, thank you, that is carried. And now we can move to the consent agenda. So the consent agenda items are usually received as one motion, but council members may request that one or more item be uh, pulled for further discussion or questions. This, uh, there are two items, any questions? I see one hand, go ahead, Councillor Hubbard. Um, to the mayor, um, the first item, uh, the new provincial regulations and statute. Um, I just wondered if, uh, if Arnie's on them on the line. I just wondered the, the one about the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing, where they're allowing timber construction up to 12 stories. Um, and the local fire department has to be notified. So I'm just curious as to how stable is such a building? Uh, I have heard of uh, a contractor who, when they went up, I think they went from three to five stories as timber and he was a little concerned himself. And now they're going to 12. I'm just wondering what the effect of that will be. I see Arnie's there, so good. go ahead, Arnie. Yes, through the mayor, that, that is a great question, Councillor Heffernan, and uh, we have to wait and see. There will be significant engineering with these sorts of buildings, and uh, they certainly would be sprinklered as well. Um, Stability-wise, uh, there's a lot of engineered wood out there that's uh, that's fantastic, and uh, it, the the industry has really grown and uh, advanced itself. So uh, I'm confident with the engineering that we have that uh, we have to have faith uh, that these designs are are stable and long for the long term. Anyone else? Yep, the floor is yours. <laughs> um, on the second item, um, I'm happy to see that we're getting funding a grant for the uh, Heritage Park washroom. I'm just wondering about. Um, well, we have enhanced security there. <laughs> Just, you know. <laughs> uh, through the chair, to answer uh, Councilman's question, absolutely. Uh, we have increased uh, great vandalism across the facility this summer. And so to protect our assets, that's the reason why we, we work with staff and budget for it. Considering that this is a uh, grant through the uh, Trillium Foundation, We'll find money in the budget to make sure we protect this asset as we were trying to do with all our other um, assets in Washington. So, we'll explain. Anyone else? Uh, go ahead, the floor is yours, Justin. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, to Councillor Hefferman, um, in regards to enhanced security, uh, through the uh, construction process, uh, it will be a concrete block wall, which is easier to uh, clean and the uh, fixtures will be similar to what uh, we put into the Weldon Park washrooms, which are more robust and uh, more of a uh, stronger commercial grade uh, rather than residential. So it adds a little bit of added cost. Uh, 
the security system uh, cameras that are around uh, the current uh, Heritage Park washrooms are multiple cameras. They are catching the kids. Unfortunately, we're not able to uh, put uh, cameras inside the washrooms. We can only uh, put cameras uh, catching uh, children or adults uh, going in and out of the washroom. So we have to uh, then narrow it down to the uh, time that staff were in there or security were in there locking up and uh, and then also uh, uh, utilize uh, uh, patrons that uh, call in uh, to announce that uh, there was vandalism or quite a mess. So we we use the existing cameras quite a bit to uh, really narrow in on the uh, times and then we uh, turn that footage over to the OPP and uh, rely on them to uh, do the follow-up and uh, investigation. Thank you, uh, Adon. I don't see any more hands. Um, there is a motion before us that consent item 6.1 through 6.2 listed on this agenda be adopted as recommended. Could I have a mover, please? Councillor Scott, thank you. And Councillor Heffernan, saw it on the way down. Uh, all in favor? And that is carried, thank you. Moving on to staff reports, we'll start with 7.1, which is replacement of tandem truck purchase. And we have our Director of Public Works and Engineering, Rob Cascati, who will be presenting that report. There you are. Hi, Rob. Hi. Good, okay. Uh, so, so thank you through Madam Mayor. I'm happy to present this report uh, for the replacement of a tandem truck um, in 2022. Um, as, as probably no surprise to members of council and, and public um, that there's certainly been price escalations in a number of different items that we've seen throughout the year. Um, the vehicle replacements is, is no different. Uh, we have been uh, looking to source a replacement tandem truck and it have had difficulties this year. Um, so the point that we're at, we're, we're looking to replace um, an existing truck with a 2023 uh, Mack Granite Tandem. Uh, our budget price was 380,000 that we had carried in the 2022 capital uh, budget. Um, the firm pricing that we have received um, through the vendor is just over 444,000, um, excluding HST. So it is an overage of about $64,000 uh, plus HST, which represents about a 16% overage um, from the, the budget that was carried. Um, we have reached out to multiple vendors and actually, and Andrew has been working on this for, I'd say a number of months. Um, the difficulty was that we couldn't even get anybody to, uh, to uh, set a build date, uh, let alone pricing. Um, and after some back and forth and, and negotiating um, one vendor, uh, Mac, uh, <clears throat> sorry, Vision, Vision Trucks uh, did come up and, and were able to price it and, and provide a firm pricing with a build date. Um, so although the budget is 16% uh, over and is, we don't feel that's out of line with other uh, pricing increases that we've seen across uh, numerous uh, supply chain issues. Um, and what we, why we're, I guess, encouraging to, uh, for council to approve the budget overage is that this does provide us at least with a, with a bill date and a firm price. Um, our concern is that if we, we don't uh, move forward with this now is that uh, prices may escalate further or the uh, potential purchase timing may, may be pushed out further. Um, so that, that's our, our request to council is to approval of the budget overage. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. I'll look to council. Uh, Councillor Harpenden. To the mayor, to Rob, um, where is the budget overage coming from, Rob? So it'll still come from, the, uh, I believe it's the, the Fleet Reserve Fund. Okay. Anyone else? And I don't recall seeing a delivery date for that. Uh, our, what, what kind of a timeline are you looking at? So we're always looking. Yeah, the, the bill time has always been very, well, so, so, shouldn't say always, but has lately, uh, recent years since, since before I was here, has been extended. We would order in one year and delivery wouldn't be until the next year. And recently it had been, even prior to COVID was pushing probably 12 months. So we know the delivery right now won't be probably until 12 to 18 months as it is. Um, but uh, again, if we if we miss this slot, it just pushes it out that much further. Oh 
yeah, that's getting to be a bigger, bigger problem. Yeah, yeah. So we're looking at a sort of additional six months on top of the usual 12. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that clarification. Anyone else? I don't see any hands. Uh, we have a motion before us. And that is that report PWE 31 2022 regarding the replacement tandem truck purchase be received and that the purchase of the new 2023 Mac Granite tandem truck be awarded to Vision Truck Group in the amount of $444,173, excluding HST, and that the budget overage of $64,173, excluding HST, be approved, and further that the mayor and the clerk be authorized to execute any necessary documents. If I could have a mover, please, and a second, Councillor Arks and Deputy Mayor Brennan. All in favor? And that is carried. Thank you. Item 7.2 is an application for a zoning bylaw amendment for 13178 Elderton Road. Um, and Marion is going to present that report for us. There you are. Uh, the floor is yours when you're ready. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and through you to Council. Uh, so this report is provide a recommendation regarding a rezoning application for the lands known as 13170 uh, Elderton Road in Elderton. Uh, so the applicant is proposing to rezone the land from an urban residential first density zone to a new site-specific urban residential third density zone, and this would permit uh, multiple unit dwellings within a new building on the property. Uh, so this property is located on the north side of Ilderton Road and west of King Street. And the applicant is proposing to remove the existing building, um, sorry, the existing single detached dwelling and erect a new building to accommodate up to five residential units on the property. Um, and I'll just share my screen to show the new site plan that the applicant has provided staff. All right, so hopefully um, you can see that on your screen. So um, the site specific zone would address the permitted uses and recognize the new building on the lot that's shown in the site plan on your screen. So this uh, site specific provisions would address the minimum lot area, lot frontage, uh, front yard setbacks, side yard setbacks to both the east and the west property lines, as well as the maximum density for the site. So this application was before council in May of 2022, and as a result of the comments from the public meeting, the applicant had revised their site plan by flipping the plan so that the driveway and the building entrance is on the western um, portion of the property, and that the building would be moved closer to the eastern property line. Um, further additional parking spaces were also provided to the rear of the proposed building. Um, so planning staff did evaluate the requested rezoning and find it appropriate given the policy directions in the provincial policy statement, as well as the county and local official plan. Um, and this is specifically with regard to providing new housing types within urban areas and supporting uh, infill and intensification within urban areas. Um, however, staff did recognize a few deficiencies based on this concept plan um, that was provided by the applicant and that they should be recognized within the amending bylaw. Um, so specifically, staff noted that the um, zoning bylaw, sorry, that in the zoning bylaw, the driveway shall not exceed 15% of the total lot area and that the parking area should be buffered at least one meter from the property line. So in the concept plan, we see that the driveway and parking area consume almost 30% of the lot. Um, we did consider alternatives for the parking space and to try to reduce that amount to meet that threshold. Um, that included moving the parking spaces to the front closer to Elkerton Road, um, but that would conflict with other policies and objectives of the official plan for the village center areas. Um, so this, um, so the zoning bylaw amendment should reflect the um, the current or what's proposed on the plan in terms of the driveway space up to 31% I believe it is. Um, additionally, staff recognize that uh, the zero uh, meter setback that's currently proposed, especially along the rear portion of this property is not sufficient to provide a buffer between the parking area and the arena lands. Um, the seeing as the land uses are generally compatible and it's a parking lot you know, against another parking lot, and that there is an existing retaining wall and chain link fence there. Staff support a reduced buffer to half a meter or 0 0.5 meters uh, to incorporate some buffer through landscaping and planting as well as the fence, and that's there. 
Um, uh, finally, staff also note that there is a reduced uh, driveway width of 5.25 meters, whereas the zoning bylaw requests a minimum of six meters. Um, and this is uh, reduced because of the ramp that is leading up to the entrances of the proposed dwelling units. Staff continue and would prefer to see a six meter uh, wide driveway to allow the safe passage of vehicles in two directions. However, we are satisfied that emergency services can access the site from Elderton Road um, as with other or existing houses along Elderton um, and that other vehicles can turn around within the parking area and then um, exit the property. Uh, further, no parking of vehicles would be permitted within the driveway area. Um, as such, our, the proposed bylaw does establish a minimum of 5.25 meters for the driveway width. Um, and finally, uh, staff also recommend a holding symbol or a H2 um, hold to be applied to the lens to require a site plan agreement to be entered into the municipality before development may occur on the lands. Um, the applicant is working with municipal staff to um, finalize their site plan application and that would be under review. Um, so in uh, class, uh, sorry, points have to determine that the zoning bylaw amendment is consistent with the PPS, the County Middlesex Official Plan, uh, Middlesex Center's Official Plan, and the, the recommended um, the recommend and the approval of the zoning bylaw as amended by staff. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for that presentation. Um, we do have Mr. Andrew Douglas here to um, uh, comment on the planning application. Trouble. Thanks uh, very much. Uh, everyone and council and uh, Marion's done a great job of summarizing the project uh, you heard from me back in May uh, so the only thing that's really changed is the flipping of the house to put the balconies on the west side as opposed to the east side which was a concern uh, from the neighbors as uh, as a privacy issue um, so I think we've done a good job of addressing that and uh, and I'd like to proceed uh, with that that change Okay, great. Um, I'll look to council then. Are there any questions for me? Yes, go ahead, Councilor Beverly. Mayor to uh, is Mary or Andrew. Um, so on this sec on this uh, site plan that we have shown by Marion, did you there's the driveway switching as well? Yes, the driveway is going to switch to the west side of the property. Okay. Correct. Okay, thanks. Oh, Deputy Mayor Brennan. Just a comment. Um, for me, this meets three criteria: intensification, um, rental units. It's handicap accessible on the on the bottom floors. So for me, it's ticking a lot of boxes. It's something we're looking for in the municipality, I think. And I think uh, for something like this to happen, it's a great start. Our municipality and I, and, uh, I am in full agreement with this. Thank you. And I'll look to Councillor Cates. <laughs> Through you, Madam Mayor, <clears throat> I uh, agree with uh, John's comments. I was going to say, I think that this uh, design is brilliant. Uh, and, you know, talk about intensification on lots of, uh, you know, property that we have available and or people have available instead of one big house. Look at what we're providing to you know, up to five families. Um, I also wanted to add to that, uh, uh, to Andrew, if your, uh, your report, uh, your letter was very, very well written. I really, uh, I really got the whole story and the gist and I thought that you presented everything very well. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Okay, I'm just going to comment too. I, I wanna to thank you for your vision and your uh, persistence in seeing it through. I think you've also exhibited flexibility in making the changes that we heard about at the last meeting in a, in a really in an easy way. That was just yeah. logic, but it's great. It's beautiful. It's in simplicity is the key to a lot of things. In any case, I echo the uh, Deputy Mayor's comments too. I hope to see a lot more of this kind of thing in our community and we want to make sure that residents who want to age in place or have a different kind of alternative to move to can stay or new people can move in. So. 
Um, if there's nothing else, then we do have a motion before us that's the Lingbaum Amendment Application ZBA 04 2022 is amended, filed by Andrew Douglas on behalf of 1917155 Ontario Inc. to rezone the lands from urban residential first density to new site specific urban residential third density with um, a holding symbol zone for the land known municipally as 13178 Gilberton Road, municipality Middlesex Centre be approved. Do I have a mover, please? Councillor Heffernan and Councillor Cates. Um, is anyone opposed? I don't see any hands, so that is carried. Thank you for coming in person. Thank you very much. All right. Pleasure to be here. Moving to 7.3, application for official plan amendment, OPA 56, and zoning bylaw amendment uh, filed by Logan Burnett on behalf of Mr. Robert Walker. Um, Marion is going to present that report. If you'd like to start, the floor is yours, Marion. All right, thank you, Madam Mayor, again, and through you to council. I'll just quickly share my screen. Okay, so um, I will be providing a recommendation regarding an official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment application for the property at 10432 Melrose Drive. The purpose of the applications are to redesignate the land from agriculture to an agricultural uh, special policy area and to rezone the lands to a site specific agricultural zone in order to permit a second single detached dwelling on the property, a home occupation, an accessory with, uh, sorry, within an accessory building outside of the main dwelling unit with outdoor storage, as well as permit a home occupation in its structure that exceeds um, the lesser of 25% of the floor area or 40 square meters. Uh, so the subject lands are approximately 10 acres in area and located on the north side of Melrose Drive and east of Coldstream Road. The lands currently contain two single detached dwellings. One is located um, towards the center of the property and one closer to Melrose Drive. The applicant has also indicated a storage barn or shed located on the northwestern portion of the lands um, is used for his business, uh, Walker Construction, and uh, lands surrounding this barn are also used for the business for trailer storage and outdoor parking. Uh, so the lands are not actively farmed and contain mostly grassed area as well as a pond and a significant woodland on the eastern portion of the property. The applicant is not proposing to construct any new buildings or expand um, the area dedicated towards his business, but is really just applying to for the redesignation and the rezoning to permit these existing uses on the lands. Uh, so this application was previously before council at a public meeting in October of 2021. Planning staff have reviewed the requested official plan amendment and the zoning by one applications and have identified two separate issues on the property and evaluated them separately. Um, so first, the applications uh, request to permit two single detached dwellings on the property. And secondly, the applications request to permit that home occupation outside of the main dwelling and uh, home occupation consuming more than 25% or 40 square meters of the floor area of the home. Um, so uh, at the public meeting um, back in October of 2021, staff had indicated that there would be support for those two dwellings um, to exist on the property where one may be considered an additional residential unit or a secondary unit to the main dwelling. As such, staff have recommended that the special policy area and the zoning bylaw both reflect and recognize that additional residential unit within the existing dwelling on the lands. Um, with regard to the home occupation, uh, staff evaluated the proposal um, with regard to the business against all the policies um, within Middlesex Center's official plan and the provincial policy statement and cannot consider the proposal to be small in scale nor meet the um, land use store or nor can the land use conflicts with the abutting land uses be mitigated or avoided in the same capacity as a home occupation within a dwelling would. Um, staff are of the opinion that the policies for home occupations have not been met by this applicant. Um, we did try to, um, or we did consider the business and the proposed use of the land against OMAFRA's guidelines for agricultural areas and cannot consider the use of land as an agricultural or agriculture related use. OMAFRA's guidelines do permit some limited commercial or industrial uses within agricultural areas. However, um, these uses are considered on-farm diversified uses and are generally secondary to a primary farm use or limited in area, uh, sorry, and limited in area. So generally these are about 2% of the total lot area. 
and staff did not find that the, the use of the land can be considered an agricultural business nor considered an on-farm diversified use and therefore should not be considered within an agricultural area. Um, similarly, staff consider the use of land to be a contractor's yard or shop per the zoning bylaw definition. And based on this, these types of industrial uses are generally directed away from agricultural areas and into urban areas where there are sufficient uh, resources and infrastructure and where uh, land use conflicts can be avoided or mitigated completely. Um, so based on this, staff cannot recommend approval of the home occupation located outside of the main dwelling or home occupation greater than 25% for area of the house, nor can staff recommend approval for the use to be considered an agriculture, agricultural related use, or on-farm diversified use. And finally, staff cannot recommend approval um, to consider the use of the contractor's yard or shop within an agricultural area and on the lands. Um, as such, staff's recommendation, as noted in the staff report, is to amend and approve the official plan and zoning bylaw amendment request to only permit the two residential uses on the property. Staff are of the opinion that the recommended zoning bylaw amendment and official plan amendment are consistent with the PPS, county, and local official plans and Middlesex Center's zoning bylaw. And I'll be happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you for that presentation. Uh, okay, so I will look to council then to ask questions and uh, get clarifications from the plan. Questions? Okay. Um, do we have a motion before us that, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Councillor. Through you, Madam Mayor. I have, uh, in reading this over um, and before when this came forward, so I just want to give some thoughts because I'm struggling a little bit with this one. Um, so I understand that at one point there was a lot of debris and stuff and junk and whatever around the property. And I believe that that has been all cleaned up. Um, uh, yes, I agree uh, with Marion on the two houses. I mean, after we're putting this in our official plan, so I in agreement with that. I am struggling with the fact that we have a business that's been in our community for 24 years and in past reports that I've read I think that Arnie and bylaw the building inspectors have been there for other things so it's not like this has been hidden for all of these years I am struggling a little bit with the fact that we're going to ask a business tell a business in our community after 24 years that they have to uh, be gone off the property so um, I just, I couldn't just not say that tonight. And I didn't know if anybody else thought the same way. Thank you. Councillor Arts. Through your Madam Mayor, uh, maybe I'm taking away what Mary would re <coughs> in your reply to Sue, but I spent a lot of time reading this and we're not approving the construction yard tonight. But I do believe there still is a process for them to go through under bylaws. I I believe that Mayor, like there, it's not quite over yet. I don't think. Uh, through Madam Mayor to Councilor Arts, um, I, I believe that is correct, and, and perhaps um, the chief building official may be able to chime in a little bit more um, about that overall process. But um, these two applications were as a result of a bylaw enforcement issue, um, where they were either where, sorry where they were directed to either remove the uses completely or have them legalized through zoning and, and through the official plan amendment. So uh, the applicant has provided um, some um, information, some data for staff to consider it a legal non-conforming use. Um, I don't think that that was appropriate for the zoning bylaw uh, amendment and for this, you know, the planning act approval process, but that might be considered by staff through the bylaw enforcement issues. Um, staff would still have the same opinion, uh, regardless of, you know, if it was considered a legal non-conforming use. And, um, you know, the intent of a non-conforming use is for it to be grandfathered out and to further permit it in perpetuity would not be supported by staff. Um, Arnie, do you want to jump in and uh, clarify or add to any of the uh, comments? Yes, so certainly uh, through the mayor. Uh, 
my comments will be somewhat limited because this does involve a bylaw enforcement matter, but uh, we do acknowledge that uh, the company has been in place there for some time. And uh, following tonight, we will reach out to the, uh, to the, the contractor or the property owner and go over what, uh, what may be legal non-conforming. And if there are some legal non-conforming aspects of the use there, that they be brought back to the legal non-conforming standards uh, the, the, the business has grown. Uh, it's been very successful and it's grown over time. So uh, if it is a legal non-conforming business, then it should be brought back to whatever standard it should be held to, um, if I can limit to that. Okay, any other questions? Okay, oh, Councillor Cates, no? And I don't see. Okay, so we do have a motion before us. Um, that zoning bylaw amendment application set the A04-2022 is amended, filed by, oopsie daisy. I read the wrong one. I'm reading the wrong, wrong, that was the one we just did. Okay, so I'm going to start again. Forget that first part. That the official plan amendment number 56 as amended, filed by Logan Burnett on behalf of Robert Walker to place special policy area on the land municipally known as 10432 Melrose Drive be adopted and forwarded to the County of Middlesex for consideration of approval. And that the zoning bylaw amendment application said BA 14 2021 as amended filed by Logan Burnett on behalf of Robert Walker to rezone the subject property from agricultural A1 zone to site specific agricultural exception 37 zone for the land municipally known as 10432 Melrose Drive be approved. Uh, do I have a mover, please, in a second? Uh, Councillor Cates and Councillor uh, Arts, uh, is anyone opposed? Uh, seeing none, then that is carried. Thank you. Okay, we can now move to uh, the Transportation Master Plan Consultant Award, and I see Rob's ready to go, so the floor is yours if you'd like. Yep, thank you. Uh, so good evening again. Uh, so through the Mayor to Council, uh, so this report is, uh, as the mayor mentioned, this is for the uh, award of the consulting assignment for the transportation master plan. Um, so as everyone is aware that we've gone, recently gone through the official plan review process and have wrapped that up at the municipal level um, and waiting for a county approval on that, as well as some other recent plans, um, such as the asset management and uh, development uh, charges update study that was conducted about a year ago. Uh, we're looking to now build on that, particularly the, the official plan review, and start setting the, the framework for, for moving forward with the expansion of, of servicing and uh, transportation servicing upgrades over you know over the next uh, ten to twenty years. Um, so as part of that, uh, there, we need to engage consultants to undertake a transportation master plan and a servicing master plan. Um, staff had originally intended to move these forward as one comprehensive uh, uh, study, um, but after further discussion uh, among staff and, and looking at uh, different consultants, we felt that there was a benefit um, to splitting them into two separate uh, master plans um, for various reasons, uh, efficiencies, um, being able to use the specific skill sets of different consultants. Um, so I decided to, to move forward with a, a standalone transportation master plan and a servicing master plan that will be coordinated um, as, as a two consultants work in parallel on those plans. Um, so this is the transportation master plan is really going to lay the framework. Um, looking at our, our municipality, we'll lay the framework for the a multimodal transportation system. Um, look for at the travel demands for the municipality over the next uh, number of years, like ideally like a 20 year horizon. Um, this will be looking at such things as uh, you know, pedestrians, bike lanes, um, uh, growth, the so the impacts on different roads where upgrades are going to be required uh, with the intent of, of coordinating that with utility uh, or servicing uh, upgrades that will also be required over that time frame. Uh, so our recommendation um, is to uh, award this consulting uh, um, assignment to IBI Group. Um, they are a, a, a consultant um, that has a very strong uh, background or expertise in undertaking uh, transportation master plans. Um, they currently are involved with the City of London's uh, mobility plan, which is essentially a transportation master plan. Uh, they work with Elgin County on a similar plan, and they're also involved with the MTO, uh, Southern Ontario, Southern Ontario uh, Multimodal Transportation Plan. Um, 
So they are, they are certainly one of the most uh, reputable consultants uh, in this field. Um, and so we, we see it as an advantage to, to build upon their local knowledge on the transportation framework in, in this area, um, as well as they, they do have an, an understanding and familiarity with the municipality um, having undertaken some uh, development design review uh, on our behalf, working with the municipality. Uh, so the budget for this project is uh, $125,000 and the, um, the fees that we have uh, negotiated with IBI group is, is just under $125,000. So just under the budget. Um, so typically we would go out to an RFP for these type of uh, consulting designations. Um, but given the, the skill set of IBI group and this, the, the, uh, the scope of this project, uh, we feel it is in the municipality's interest to do a, a sole source um, award to IBI group. Um, and we will be bringing forward a, a recommendation for the servicing master plan separately. Um, so at this point, I'm happy to answer any questions that council may have. Thank you for that presentation, Rob. I'll look to council. Uh, Deputy Mayor Brennan. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Through you to Rob. Rob, uh, the plan, I hope, it, it, it's my hope that it will have in it things that will for lack of better words, direct traffic to county roads. Mm. The county roads are built for um, a lot of traffic and, and a lot of our roads are. But as we build up our own roads, we see a lot of increased traffic simply because it's convenient for people because it's a paved road. And really, we what we really want to see is the commuter traffic used to the county roads. Is there any way through a, a master plan like this we can get that traffic to the county roads that are designed to handle that? Yeah, no, that, that's so through Mayor to, uh, Deputy, the Deputy Mayor. Um, that's, that's a good question. That's certainly something we can look at. It's, uh, I guess it's, it's probably a bit of a complicated issue. So I know the desire is to push traffic to the county roads. And you always have those higher class roads that will carry more more traffic. But as we, as we see our population grow and there's just more cars on the road, we, you know, no doubt that we're going to have our roads where we um, we go from one class to another class of road just with more more daily trips. Um, and when that happens and we, you know, kind of we're kind of stuck in that position, right? It's kind of the whole gravel, gravel to a paved road. And once you, once you pave it, then your your vehicle count goes up that much more likely because people want to use it. Uh, so to a certain extent, we, there's we're maybe stuck in a little bit of that, but that's certainly something we can look at and and the, the intent will be to have those those uh, those higher class roads to be the, the main conduit for traffic. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there won't be upgrades required to some of our local roads as well. Other questions? I guess I, I had a question that's similar to the deputy mayor's. It has to do with, um, I think you've already answered, but I'm just gonna make sure I understand. the. Um, County roads are part of it, but our arterial roads and our other roads that intersect or may intersect with city um, plans, is that integration or are those boundary pieces addressed in the plan as well? Or how does that work? Because I mean, we're, we're fairly big and we touch different municipalities and different yep. points and different places. How does that work? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Yeah, so the, the intent here is really to have that, that broad scope look. And I think in one of the points uh, that, that Andrew made in the report here um, was the coordination and looking at the master plans uh, with adjacent municipalities as well, right? And including the county, right? So we really want them to have a comprehensive look at this, um, even the how um, we're adjacent to the city of London, right? Which is which is a major component of traffic, of people traveling into the city and back out, right? So, and that's where we see part of their their strength is that they've been involved with the city of London. They, they've done uh, traffic modeling with the city of London. So that's something they can build upon uh, when they're looking at Middlesex Center. Thank you for that. Brad? Yes, I see your hand. I see your hand up there. Right. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, through you, Madam Mayor, to Rob. So uh, you mentioned that you're separating these and doing a service master plan on its own. Uh, obviously, they complement each other, I'm assuming, right? Like uh, they work together. They look at each other. The transportation plan lays out some of the infrastructure for servicing. And is that, in the, is that on the go also? 
Yep. So uh, through the through Madam Mayor to uh, to Councillor Scott. So no good question. So the intent is to bring uh, the next report back on the August sixth meeting for award of the master servicing plan, um, and then to have both going um, in parallel. Um, and and I, I have no doubt that there'll, there'll be communications between consultants, but staff will also be that uh, that co coordinating point between the two consultants as well. Um, but yeah, certainly the intent is, yeah, although they're being done separately, that there'll be coordination between the two of them. Perfect. Thank you, Rob. Okay, last call. I don't see any hands. The motion before us is that report PWE 24 2022 regarding transportation master plan consultant award be received and that the transportation master plan be awarded to IBI Group in the amount of $124,965, excluding HST. And further, that the mayor and the clerk be authorized to execute the necessary contract documents. Um, if I could have a mover, please, and a seconder, Councillor Scott, uh, Deputy Mayor Brennan. Any opposed? Uh, seeing none, that is carried then. Thank you for that presentation, Rob. Okay, we have to move into committee adjustment now. So a motion, please, that the council adjourn its regular meeting at 7.01 p.m. in order to sit as a committee of adjustment under section 45 of the Planning Act 1990 as amended to consider the minor variance applications listed on the July 20th, 2022 Council agenda. Uh, mover please, and seconder, Councillor uh, Everton and Councillor Arts, all the or any um, post, and that is carried and thank you. So just before we go into that meeting, I'm going to go through some general remarks. Um, members of the public that wish to receive further notification on any minor variance applications being considered today, I ask that you please send an email to planning at middlesexcenter.ca requesting further notification. Please be advised that comments expressed and written material presented are a matter of public record um, for full disclosure. If you have any questions on any of the applications being heard this evening, we ask that you direct those to the appropriate planner on file. Members of the public that have requested to speak will be given a maximum of 10 minutes to address council and provide comments on the applications. In keeping with our procedural bylaw and our zone policy, I would remind all of our meeting participants to use respectful language and uphold our values of cooperation, trust and openness. So the order of proceedings is the same for each of the applications. Um, first, the chair will ask, that be myself, will ask the planner to explain the purpose of the application and hearing and present the staff report. Then we'll um, give the opportunity to the applicant or their agent to speak to the application. The public who have registered will be asked for their comments. Please state your name and address so that comments can be reflected in the minutes. Then staff will note additional comments received from circulated agencies and the public not included in the planning report. Uh, then the committee will have an opportunity to ask questions of the applicant and or staff. And then finally, I'll call um, to consider motions regarding the applications. So the um, 8.1 is the application for minor variance. And we have Dan Fitzgerald, our planner, to give an overview of the, of the report. Go, go ahead, Dan, when you're ready. Testing. <laughs> uh, through the chair. <laughs> Through the chair of the mayor. Uh, I'm sorry. Members sorry of the committee. That. Thank you for having me here tonight. It's been two long years since I've been in this chamber, so it's nice to be here in person speaking with council face to face. Um, so with respect to this application, it's A14-2022, uh, and it would be to permit the planned development of a public utility or a high-speed internet service. Uh, on a lot which received provisional consent on May 18th, 2022. Uh, the applicant, uh, as a condition of that consent, is seeking to reduce the minimum lot size requirements as well as the depth of the lot that was provisionally approved. Uh, additionally, they are seeking permission to reduce the minimum front yard setback, minimum interior side yard setback, uh, the minimum rear yard setback as well. And the effect of the proposal again, is to facilitate the construction of uh, what's referred to as a switch house building uh, for internet services. Uh, the portion of the land subject to the minor variance application is currently vacant. It remains part of the larger agri agricultural lands at this time. Uh, and it also maintains frontage along County Road 23. 
uh, the subject lands are designated agricultural area according to the county official plan and agricultural according to Middlesex Center's official plan. Uh, they are zoned a highway commercial C2 zone in the Middlesex Center zoning bylaw. I noticed that the application was circulated and agents, two agencies as well as the surrounding property owners within 60 meters of the lands and no comments were received from the public or agencies. Uh, I have reviewed the request for minor variance against the four uh, Planning Act tests, those being if it's minor in nature, considered appropriate development of the lands, and if it meets the intent of the zoning bylaw as well as the official plan. Uh, as the proposed bar minor variance is necessary to implement development of the parcel, uh, in addition to reducing the size of the lands to limit the impact of the development within the agricultural area, I am of the opinion that the variance does meet the tests of the Planning Act. Uh, further, I would note that the county engineer has not expressed any concerns with any reductions to setbacks. Uh, I would note that the plans as shown are conceptual and as such development of the site may change based on the detailed design of the engineering review for site plan. However, the location of the building should generally be consistent with the location that is shown on these particular plans attached to the report. So as such, uh, I am recommending that the subject application be approved. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that presentation. And uh, the applicant, Mr. Ben Weichhorn, is attending. Thank you for the moment. Good evening, Mr. Weichhorn. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council members, staff, and else sitting out front there. Um, nice to uh, nice to have people in person, be able to feel comfortable enough to do that again. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak, and uh, I'm not going to speak very much because uh, once again, uh, our uh, our planner has an excellent job in uh, in presenting um, what what we're we're trying to to do. And basically, uh, the the only comment I will make is is we we went for a small piece of property because we need to do what we're trying to do, um, which uh, it wouldn't likely fit within any classification. So so the setback uh, reductions and lot size re reductions would have been required regardless of the place. But uh, this is the location that makes the most sense for uh, Quadro and. Uh, you know, with the, the swift funding available, uh, as long as the building's built this year, it, it's just the perfect loan, and uh, this this makes it all work. So uh, I won't say any more unless, uh, well, certainly they'll answer any questions, and uh, would would prefer to uh, to proceed that way than to uh, repeat anything else that Dan has already presented, and uh, uh, and and I will stop now. Okay, thank you then. Um, the clerk indicated that there are no additional comments that have been received by his office. I'll look to the committee. Are there any questions? I had one little thing. Um, in the diagram that shows the site plan, there's the, um, you can see where the road comes in on our picture. It's on the top right side. It says asphalt parking lot area. And then to the left of it, kind of looks like grass, but it's labeled recycled asphalt parking area. And I see two spaces marked there. I wonder, is the intention to um, have two kinds of asphalt across the whole top of the property? Am I seeing that correctly? Um, um, the septic bed's in the other corner. Yeah, at the um, bottom right. Yes, I, frankly, I, uh, I, I didn't realize that we had the second type of asphalt there. Um, I don't know if Jason is, uh, is available tonight as well. Um, Apparently he is. He is available. I wonder if-, okay. if And the clerk's bringing him in right now. That, uh, that would be helpful.
Oh, okay, Jason's on the line. I don't think we'll see him then. Did you hear my question? I did, yes. Um, so oh. basically, that that is a that would be like a compound lot. So instead of just paving it all, <clears throat> like we're gonna pave coming down from the road, but that, that area is gonna be essentially for staging if we ever had to place a fiber optic reel or anything like that. So it's just recycled asphalt for cost savings instead of having uh, paved asphalt for that uh, entire okay. area. Well, that makes sense in terms of the, because you indicate there's chain link fence around it as well. So that makes sense. The cars are, it's not car parking. It's, yeah, I get it. It's very clear now. Thank you. Not a problem. Any other okay. Any other questions? Okay. Still none. So in that case, we have a motion before us that minor variance application A-14-2022 filed by Ben Waghorn for relief from the zoning bylaw to reduce the lot size requirements, lot lot depth requirements, front yard setbacks, interior side yard setbacks, and rear yard setbacks, amounting to a lot coverage of 39.71% for all structures for a property municipally known as 152058 Mile Road be granted subject to the following conditions, that all the development be placed in the same general location as shown on the plans, and that the reasons for granting the minor variance application A142022 are that the request complies with the general intended purpose of Middlesex Centre's official plan and zoning bylaw, the request is minor in nature, and the request represents appropriate development on the subject property. I'll look for a mover and a seconder, please. Moved by Councillor Hefferman, Councillor Kate Seconds. Uh, anyone opposed? Seeing none, and that is carried. Thank you very much for your time, gentlemen. And now Thanks. we have to move. Oh, good night. Uh, we're going to move into public meeting now. And uh, so the motion is that the Committee of Adjustment adjourn at 7.11 p.m. and Council resume their regular reading and that Council move into public meetings at 7.11 pursuant to the Planning Act RS01 uh, 1990 as amended to consider the applications listed on the July 20th, 2022 Council agenda. Mover, please stand to second. Councilor Arts, Councilor Heffernan, is anyone opposed? And seeing none, then um, again, in this case, uh, members of the public who wish to receive notification on any applications being considered uh, could please send an email to planning at middlesexcenter.ca requesting further notification. Please be advised that comments expressed and written material presented are a matter of public record. Again, those who have requested to speak will be given 10 minutes to address council and provide comments on the applications. And in keeping with our procedural bylaw and our RSO policy, I would remind all of our meeting participants to use respectful language, uphold our values of cooperation, trust, and openness. And the proceedings, uh, the order of which is the same, basically, I'll ask the planner to present the purpose and uh, the application and hearing, and then uh, present the staff report. The applicant or their agent will have an opportunity to speak to their application. The public will be asked for their comments. Again, please ensure you state your name, your address, uh, so that comments can be reflected in the minutes. I look then to council to ask questions of the applicant and or staff, and then we will consider motions regarding the applications. So the first item before us tonight is an application uh, for zoning bylaw amendment for uh, 23752 Kamoku Road, filed by Alan Wood and Marion Wood, and I'll ask Marion Cabral, please to present the overview of the report. Great. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and through the council. Uh, the municipality did receive a zoning bylaw amendment application for a temporary use for the lands known as 23752 Kamoka Road. Uh, the purpose of this report is to make a recommendation on the requested um, rezoning uh, for a temporary use permit for the construction of a new single detached dwelling uh, while living in the existing single detached dwelling on the property, the temporary use would only apply for a period of up to three years and upon expiration or completion of the new dwelling, an existing uh, residence would need to be removed. Uh, so this proposal is related to a recent minor variance uh, file that recognized two single detached dwellings on the lands. As a result of the temporary use zone, a total of three dwellings would be permitted on a temporary basis um, with one to be removed upon completion of that new building. 
So this requested application is generally consistent with the policies of the PPS, the County Official Plan, and Middlesex Center Official Plan as it relates to permitting a single family dwelling in relation to an agricultural operation. Uh, the application was circulated to area residents, agencies, and staff. Staff did not receive any comments from area residents um, or any agencies. Um, Public Works and engineering department have requested that the applicant submit a $10,000 deposit and enter into an agreement with the municipality to ensure the removal of one of the two dwellings um, that currently exist on the property once the new dwelling is occupied. Um, as such, staff determined that the requested zoning bylaw amendment for a temporary use zone to permit a total of three dwellings on the property for a period of up to three years is consistent with all applicable policies, including the Middlesex Center official plan. As such, staff recommend that the applications be approved and that the owner enter into temporary use agreement with the municipality and require, um, sorry, that will require all, um, sorry, removal of one of the two existing dwellings um, and submit a deposit of $10,000 to the municipality. I'll be happy to answer any questions on this. Okay, thank you for that presentation. Um, we don't have anyone registered to speak at any of the other levels. I'll look to council. Are there any questions on the report? Marion, I have one question for you. You said one of the two dwellings. My assumption was that the dwellings were defined in terms of which one would be removed. And do I understand correctly now that they would have the option to choose which building would remain as a secondary dwelling? Uh, yes, um, so to answer your, your question, so in terms of uh, just trying to draft the use zoning bylaw um, itself and being that prescriptive, it's a little bit difficult to, to do so and to identify specifically which property, but the applicant um, has indicated that they would um, remove, uh, I believe it was the southernmost uh, property in order to accommodate the new dwelling um, in that general location. So they, they are aware of which dwelling will be removed, but just in terms of trying to write out the bylaw, um, it was just a little bit difficult to be that prescriptive. Okay, I get it. I was assuming it would be the suddenly one because that's the home they live in, but I didn't really understand that there was an option. That's great. Thank you kindly for that. If there's nothing else, then we do have a motion before us that zoning bylaw amendment applications at BA 03 2022 for a temporary use zone filed by Alan Wood and Marion Wood to permit three single detached dwellings on one property for up to three years to allow a new residence to be constructed on the land known as 23752 Kavoka Road be approved and that the owner be required to enter into a temporary use agreement with the municipality and submit a deposit of $10,000 to ensure the removal of the next existing residence. Um, could I have a mover please? And a second. Uh, Councillor Scott and Councillor Cates, anyone opposed? All right, that is carried and thank you. And I think that's it for you tonight, isn't it? Marianne, good night. Okay, Dan, who is in the room? <laughs> um, could I ask you to present the report for item 9.2 uh, with respect to sand lands in Hoka? Uh, through the chair, thank you, Madam Mayor and members of council. Uh, the purpose of this consent application uh, is with respect to a consent to sever an existing portion of the CN rail uh, reserve lands, which are located on the east side of Queen Street. Uh, with a proposed frontage of approximately 102 meters on Queen and an area of approximately 3.57 acres. And the effect of the proposal uh, would be to facilitate the, the disposition or sale of the lands uh, to be developed in accordance with the official plan uh, settlement employment designation on, the, on this particular parcel. Uh, the subject lands are located on the uh, northeast side, uh, respectively of Queen Street, uh, between Railway Avenue and Huron Avenue. The proposed severance would abut the existing CN Rail corridor to the north and the existing residential lands uh, in the format of single detached residential dwellings to the southeast, uh, south, southwest, as well as northwest. The lands are currently vacant and have been deemed surplus as part of the CN Rail uh, corridor in Kamoka. Uh, the subject property is located within a settlement area, according to the county official plan. Uh, it's designated settlement employment in Middlesex Center's official plan, and it's zoned existing use or EU in Middlesex Center's zoning bylaw. 
Uh, just as a refresher, this application was originally uh, scheduled to be heard by council on December 15th, 2021. However, uh, subject to the request by the applicant, it was referred back to staff uh, to further discuss the conditions that were listed in the original uh, planning report that went on the agenda. Uh, notice of the application was also circulated to agencies as well as all property owners in accordance with the Planning Act requirements. Uh, I'm not aware of any comments expressing any concerns uh, or opposition to the proposed severance. And in terms of the internal review, all comments uh, which have been associated uh, with the proposed severance have also been incorporated as conditions of consent or recommended conditions of consent. Uh, appropriately sized and scaled infill development is considered an efficient use of land and infrastructure within the municipality. Additionally, as employment lands, they are ideally located to promote appropriate business activity, uh, which support economic drivers within Middlesex Center. Uh, as a note to council, the applicant or the subsequent agent of the purchaser uh, will be required to rezone the property uh, as a condition of consent confirming the intended use prior to, certi prior to any certificates of consent being issued. So they will be still subject to a further public review and process with respect to a zoning bylaw amendment application. Uh, given the above, I am of the opinion that the subject application is consistent with the PPS county official plan, as well as the local official plan. And as such, I am recommending approval of provisional consent uh, subject to the conditions that are outlined in the planning report. Thank you. Thank you for that report. Uh, we also have Andrea Patterson in attendance virtually on behalf of the applicant to comment on the report. And she's just coming on now. Hello, Madam Mayor, members of council. My name is Andrea Patterson. I'm a land use planner at uh, Denton's Canada LLP, and I'm here on behalf of Canadian National Railway Company uh, with respect to this application for consent to create a new lot. Um, I would like to speak to um, the matter. Um, do you want me just to go ahead now? Oh, yes, I'm sorry, okay. the floor is yours. Go ahead. Do okay, your... sorry. I think I lost no, the, the, that initial bit of the connection there. Um, Not to I, worry, go ahead. Thank you. I wanted to, first of all, thank uh, Dan Fitzgerald for his hard work on this application. And, um, you know, it's been a, a back and forth process, uh, primarily for clarification. And I just wanted to, again, yeah, thank you for your work on this and also um, for your comments in the report. Um, we're, agreement, we're in agreement with the comments in the staff report um, and note the recommendation that the consent application be approved. Um, there are, however, or remain, however, three conditions that I would like to speak to. And um, specifically it's conditions seven, eight and nine on your agenda. Um, and the reason for this is uh, I think CN, um, it's a unique situation because CN as the existing owner, um, as you know, is not a land developer. And so really this exercise to um, sever lands that are deemed surplus to their needs um, is a process that uh, we have undergone throughout various locations in Southern Ontario. And then the intention is that the land is sold for someone to come and, and develop it in accordance with existing zoning, or if, if th that is non-compliance, then they would go through a required public process. Um, and so I would respectfully submit that condition seven, um, uh, with respect to the servicing, the information just isn't there for the owner to, to provide for that connection. And I would um, suggest that that's more appropriate to do at site plan approval stage when you have that level of detail and you know exactly where those connections are required for the servicing. Um, similarly, connect, um, condition eight um, for the road improvement is more a development related condition. And again, I would ask that that be um, applied at site plan approval and re removed from the consent application. Um, 
this one just also, it, it was a bit confusing because I know that initially there was an amount of $11,000 in the 2021 report. And then the current staff report says $30,000 and the recommendations under the agenda say $63,000. So I'm, I'm not sure sort of what that was based on, but I just wanted to point out that inconsistency. Um, but regardless, we would ask that that be um, applied at the time of site plan approval. And then lastly, condition nine, cash in lieu of parkland, again, um, development related. So we would respectfully ask that that be applied at site plan approval. Okay, thank you for those comments. Um, I'll look to the, are there any others? Okay, thank you. So I'll look to council then. Are there questions on the presentation or the um, comments we've just heard? Councillor Cates, we'll start with you. Thank you, through you, Madam Mayor. Um, I guess today, um, I don't know that I'm uh, in agreement with the removal of the seven, eight, and nine. Um, in is it, aren't I correct, Dan, that uh, everybody has these in there at this stage? If you have a uh, one resident with an extra wide lot and they want to sever it off, it's all done at the time now of the of the severance. It, is that not correct? Uh, through the chair to Councilor Cates, yes. Yeah. So. Generally speaking, uh, the requirement for condition number seven, which is the installation of separate water and sanitary service connections, is based on our official plan requirements that all lots have to be serviced within an urban service area. Uh, so if we're preemptively severing lots that aren't serviced to the property lines, uh, we could be potentially in contravention with our own official plan. So that's why that is a standard requirement uh, of our official planning consent process as recommended. I would also note um, condition eight. Uh, I do understand there was is a bit of inconsistency as to what was in the initial report and what was in the planning report and what is now in the recommendations. I do apologize for that. There was a holding number in there in their planning report that was meant to be um, updated uh, as part of uh, as part of that. It was updated in the condition section, but it was missed in the report. So I do apologize for that. That was just based on uh, waiting for that clarification from public works and engineering as to what that fee amount would be uh, based on a 102 meter frontage uh, on Queen Street. So that's something that the, the that your municipality Middlesex Center does charge the standard consent fee uh, for applicants. Uh, and then third, uh, condition number nine, uh, that's in your fees bylaw. So that's entrenched in your actual fees bylaw. Any consent application for, uh, for any consent other than a residential consent is subject to a $1,300 cash flow payment for parkland. Uh, so it would, I, I guess it would be up to council with how they want to proceed on that. I can only certainly recommend uh, what the documents that I have in front of me and what, what your official plan states and your other bylaws, uh, but certainly council has the purview to look into that further. I looked at other councillors. That's what happening. To um, Dan, so basically, CN really just wants to sever off this piece of property that they that they don't need. It's just sitting there, and so they just uh, want to get rid of it. Uh, through the charity councilor happening, yes, that's my understanding of the situation. It's uh, it's been identified as uh, additional lands that's uh, surplus to their needs in that particular area. They have a, my understanding is they have an interested party to purchase the land. Uh, or have identified an interest party to purchase land, and that's why they're proceeding with the severance of that to dispose of it. Anyone else? Is it is it possible, Dan, that um, if they already have an interested party, could these conditions be put on the party that purchases it? Uh, through the charity council, Heffernan, I I would agree with you that it could be working to the purchase and sale agreement with CN. It doesn't have to involve the municipality at all. We would just want to make sure that our conditions as being standard are met as part of the application process. That was going to be my question. I'll just word it differently. If there are costs to be recouped, they aren't necessarily our responsibility. They would be the purchase and 
per, the vendor and purchaser agreement can cover off all of that. Okay, so we can stick to our planning application rules as they stand. Okay, anyone else? I don't see any hands. Uh, we do have a motion before us, just to make sure I'm on the right page here. Consent. Um, oh, here it is. Okay, consent application B20, which is CN Rails. The motion is that the application B20, 2021, filed by Denton, Canada, LLP, on behalf of Canada. Canadian National Railway Company in order to sever a lot with a post frontage of approximately 102 meters on Queen Street with an area of approximately 1.44 hectares, that is 3.57 acres, and the retained parcel being the existing railway corridor on a property legally described as part lot six, possession two, in the municipality of Middlesex Centre, be granted and of the consent B20 2021 be subject to the 11 conditions that are noted in the report further that the reasons for granting the consent application include that it is consistent with the provincial policy statement, the proposal conforms to the County of Middlesex official plan and the Middlesex Centre official plan, and the proposal is capable of complying with Middlesex Centre comprehensive zoning bylaw subject to a rezoning. Do I have a mover and a second? Councillor Cates and uh, Deputy Mayor Brennan, is anyone opposed? I don't see any hands, and that is carried then. Thank you uh, for that one, Dan. And we can move now to 9-3, if you will. Uh, through the chair, thanks, Madam Mayor and members of council. Uh, the purpose and effect of consent applications uh, B2 slash 2021 and B7 slash 2022 uh, is to sever a surplus farm residence on a lot with a frontage of approximately 74 uh, and a half meters on Gold Creek Drive in an area of approximately 1.29 acres, as well to establish a shared access uh, easement across the retained agricultural parcel of land uh, for the neighboring farmland access. Uh, the retained farmland would maintain a broken frontage of approximately 1,389 meters on Gold Creek Drive and an area of approximately 203.7 acres. Uh, the application, or sorry, the applicant is proposing to maintain a single detached dwelling and detached accessory buildings, including sheds uh, with the severed parcel. And the remnant parcel would maintain a single detached dwelling and three accessory buildings along with four grain buildings or grain bins. Uh, the proposed easement on the retained lands would permit uh, guaranteed access across the agricultural parcel uh, to land situated southeast of uh, this particular farm parcel. Uh, it, concurrently, the applicant has also submitted a zoning bylaw amendment application uh, where the purpose and effect of that application would be to rezone the severed lands from an agricultural A1 zone to the surplus residential or SR zone uh, in order to recognize the residential nature of the property. Uh, the retained lands are proposed to be rezoned from an agricultural A1 zone to a site-specific agricultural no residence or A3 exception zone, uh, which would remove the future ability to construct an additional residence on uh, the subject lands should a further severance of that parcel occur. I would note to council that the application was previously heard and referred back to staff based on new information that was presented at the previous public meeting regarding a shared access easement through the lands that were identified as the separate parcel. Uh, as a result, uh, the applicant has also applied for consent for access easement, uh, being consent file B7 uh, slash 2022, uh, being heard here tonight uh, to establish the separate guaranteed access in perpetuity for the neighboring farm parcel, uh, that being part lot 11 concession for uh, North. I would also note to council that uh, there is an, an error in the existing mapping, the notice that was sent out uh, with the uh, application to the public. Uh, the lands include both the agricultural parcel at 10651 Gold Creek Drive uh, to the west and uh, 10723 Gold Creek Drive all together as one uh, farm parcel. 
Uh, the lands as a whole are approximately 204 acres uh, and contain two existing single detached dwellings and associated agricultural structures. Uh, it's designated agricultural according to the uh, municipality's official plan and zoned agricultural A1 zone in the comprehensive zoning bylaw. In circulation of the application, and as previously indicated, uh, planning did receive additional comments through the form of questions by neighboring landowners. Uh, concerns raised were related to the access easement, particularly uh, to guarantee farm access perpetuity, uh, which is adequate to support the size of equipment that's used in farming practices today. I would note that the applicant has shown a five and a half meter access easement or 18 feet, uh, which can be seen on the draft reference plan that was attached to the planning report. Uh, concerns were also raised with respect to the path being uh, demarcated uh, and located favorably uh, to permit access. As it was indicated, there are some uh, walls and dips within that particular area. Uh, as a result of, the, of that particular uh, um, opinions or uh, questions that were uh, provided by the public, I am recommending the inclusion of an additional condition uh, for consent B7 2022, uh, and that being as follows. Uh, that the access easement be clearly marked and placed in a location that is readily traversable by the owners of part lot 11 concession 4 north to the satisfaction of the municipality and that the applicant be required to update the Serbian and tenement land titles clearly defining the location of the access easements at the sole cost of the applicant. So as such, the additional condition provides the municipality the opportunity to review the location of the access easement once it has been marked out and demarcated by the surveyor, along with the neighboring landowners to ensure that the access is suitable to meet their needs uh, for now and into the future. Uh, generally, I would note the provincial policy statement, county official plan and local official plan do permit surplus farm dwelling severances as long as the municipality is satisfied that a farm consolidation is occurring, the lands contain municipal or private servicing, the dwelling is habitable and constructed prior to 1999, no new residence is permitted to be established and access to the lands is maintained. I would also note that the municipality maintains an interim control bylaw with respect to surplus dwelling consent applications. However, as a note to council, as well as the public that's watching here tonight, uh, the subject application being heard was submitted prior to the enactment of that interim control bylaw and as such a decision can be made on the application by council. As identified in the report, planning staff are satisfied that the criteria of the proposed severance for the surplus farm residents on the lands have been met or are capable of being met through the appropriately addressed conditions through consent. Based on the above, uh, staff are recommending that consent file B2021 and B7-2022 be approved subject to the conditions that have been outlined in the planning report, as well as the additional condition mentioned here tonight. Additionally, staff recommend that the proposed zoning bylaw amendment being ZBA4-2021 be approved and that the implementing bylaw be forwarded to council and approved uh, once in a deposited reference plan has been provided for staff review. So thank you, and I'm certainly available to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you for that presentation. And now we have um, Ashley Pondinsky and Brad Hemrick, um, who are in attendance virtually uh, here for, um, to present um, comments on the application, and they are with Strathroy Law. Um, thank you for, for hearing us through the chair and Madam Mayor to the committee. We've been talking to your planner, Mr. Fitzgerald, quite a bit um, uh, throughout the year about this application. I'm sure um, we've made his life interesting at some times, um, but we feel that this severance checks a lot of the boxes um, required for such a severance. We do recognize the concern with the property to the south and access to that property. It's my understanding the executives of these states have been working with them to propose a new easement that'll conceptually, you know, generally comport with the submitted sketch, um, but that we, we recognize it hasn't been clearly demarcated on the ground 
until such time as this, the surveyors go out there um, and kind of and mark that out. Um, at that time, we feel that we'll be able to work with the neighbors some more to make sure that um, it is what they want. And obviously, the severance has been made conditional on, you know, getting that easement uh, moved off of the severed parcel onto the retained farmland. And that can't happen. Well, we recognize that can't happen without um, the neighbors, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Reichheld, um, signing off on that because this directly affects their ownership on their property. So um, we're not able to force them to accept this. We're, our hope is that the new easement that we're creating will be better than the old one. Um, we see that through the discussions, I'm of the understanding that the old easement had um, its problems and that the new one should be better than the old one. And our, our clients, the executives of the estate are committed to trying to make that happen. Um, and obviously we understand if that doesn't happen, then, then, you know, that we're not meeting the conditions of the severance. Um, I heard uh, Mr. Fitzgerald's new condition that um, the easement be clearly demarcated um, obviously, the satisfaction of the municipality and, and goes without saying that the neighbor will have to agree to this as well. Again, it's directly affecting, it's deleting their old easement and putting this new one in place. So, of course, they have to be satisfied as well. Um, and we, I don't think our, my client will have any problem or and it is already of the understanding that all this work is being done at the estate's cost. I would ask that before we agree to the new condition, I'd just be granted a few minutes to speak with the executors to make sure that's okay. I have spoken to them about all of the other conditions that Mr. Fitzgerald has proposed, and our client is in total agreement with them. We feel that once the, you know, the, the, the surveyors come out and put stakes and, and mark the ground where the season is going to be, I think that's going to give everyone a much better feeling as to exactly where this is. Um, and, and, and what's going on. I think uh, the final hurdle could be overcome at that time. Again, uh, we feel that that's already taken care of in, in the application. I know Ms. Ashley Podolinski has been dealing with the executors as of late more, more than I have and with Gavin um, or an SPM surveyor. So I, if she would like to speak to it, or you, um, we're happy to answer any questions you may have or speak to any concerns raised by the public tonight. Um, either one of us might be better, one of us will be maybe better appropriate to, to address different kinds of questions, but we want to make ourselves available to do this. And thank you for hearing me. Thank you. And next we have the, um, uh, Mr. And Mrs. Mr. And Mrs. Reichel are in attendance tonight for a uh, comment on the application. I don't know why you're concerned about hearing us. We haven't heard you since the beginning of time. The sound in this room is terrible. Hi, your microphones are very uh, difficult to hear and it kind of rebounds in this large room. And I'm afraid I did not hear the presentation that, you know, to know what was said. Uh, I don't know how to cover that. Our, um, our position is, of course, to protect our easement to be available for farm use uh, in perpetuity. And, uh, I thank you very much, Dan, for your answer to our concerns in a letter. You were very comprehensive and I appreciate it. I certainly want the uh, additional um, uh, proviso, or you call it, that the access easement be clearly marked and placed in a location that is readily traversable, et cetera. That paragraph, yes, I definitely want to see that in the, in the uh, application so that it's clear. Our concern is that with stakes in the ground and it be properly demarked, demarcated so that any future owners on either side, their property or ours, would have it clearly marked and there would be no dispute. Sorry. 
there are two uh, very large trees. Um, the access, I think I heard him say that the new route is better than the old route. Uh, there haven't been problems with either one. The neighbors are cooperative and we've never had a difficulty with it. Uh, but the two large trees at the new entrance uh, might be difficult to navigate in the future if farm equipment gets larger. Right now, farm arms sort of fold up and if, if we can't get through the two trees because of the branches being in the way, that might be a difficulty. As long as, as, long as the uh, stakes are in the ground, uh, which Dan has assured us they will be before it's all approved, that uh, that, that would be acceptable. The new route as uh, goes with the severance sketch. That seems to be acceptable. We've been over there, we've walked the ground and it all looks good. And so uh, we're, we're not making any objection. I'm sure that the legalese is on our deed in perpetuity. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, Dan, I should clarify, is there anything you want to comment on or clarify with regard to comments we've heard? Uh, through the chair to uh, the resident there. So yeah, you're, you're exactly correct. And can you hear me okay? Just. It would be better if you spoke up. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll speak as loudly as I can, if that Perfect. works. Okay, uh, so with respect to your comments there, uh, yes, so through, um, at this point, they're only seeking provisional consent, uh, which means the consent does not actually uh, occur until such time as they request a certificate as issued by the municipality. And they, in order to do that, they have to fulfill all of the conditions that are listed uh, in the decision of that consent first. Uh, so as you have kind of indicated, uh, it's, it's important to have it demarcated. It's a, it, just as much as it is for you, it is for me as well, because uh, we need to ensure that your land has proper access as well uh, for now and into the future. Um, so, Yes, uh, standard practice would be that a surveyor, once the provisional consent is issued, they would go out and actually put the, the steel bars in the ground, uh, as well as uh, stakes that would kind of show exactly where those steel bars are located. Uh, the purpose for the inclusion of that uh, additional condition was to give us the opportunity to actually go out there and look at it and make sure that it will meet your needs for access you did indicate that there were some lower areas uh, that may be of concern in terms of getting equipment through. Uh, so that gives us the opportunity to go out, out there afterwards to look at that, make sure uh, that the alignment of that path is correct. And if, there, if we need to make changes, we can do that. So, uh, so that the municipality at the end of the day is satisfied that you have guaranteed access that will be appropriate for the size of equipment that you have uh, for your farm operation. Um, I don't think there's anything else that I want to cover, but if there's any further questions, I can certainly answer them. Can okay, we thank go? you for, oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to ask if we could go with you when you're inspecting the property, could we be there? Uh, through the chair of the property owner, yes, absolutely. When I go out to inspect the property with this, the chief building official, I would have no issue with uh, either yourself and obviously the property owner to attend as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you for uh, clarifying any final lingering questions in our minds. And now I would like to um, ask if there are any members of the public who are attending this meeting virtually who would like to comment on this application, please use your raised hand feature now. And if you're here in person on this file, of course, you should have an opportunity to speak to. Okay, we're clear then. I will now turn to council then. Questions, comments? Councilor Arts, start off please. Through your Madam Mayor to Dan, <clears throat> I've got one question on the easement. Is it just a, a dirt path? There's no prerequisite for it to be gravel based or anything or I'm just asking that that will be in the easement so that there's no misunderstanding between both property owners. Yeah, so through the chair to the council arts, um, the only thing that we would be concerned about from the municipal perspective is that it is appropriate for the type of use of the land. Uh, if it does necessitate a layer of gravel, 
to us to allow for that permanent access, then that's something that we would seek as part of that condition clearance. Um, typically for these types of easements, we wouldn't put gravel in place, but there could be situations that would necessitate it. So once we get out there and we actually see what we're dealing with, we'll know better. And I've got one other question for Dan. The, the severed house, when, uh, when there's a severance, surplus farm severance, they get a little package saying, you know, they're going to accept all agricultural practices. It, there's grain bins on this property, so they do realize that grain bins have bands that run all night, and there might be a grain dryer there that runs all night, just, just so they know, so it's not a surprise. Yeah, so through the chair of council arts, so one of the conditions that we typically include as a standard uh, in our consent for surplus dwelling severances are what we refer to as severance agreements that are listed on title of the property. Uh, and that basically identifies to uh, the current landowners or any future landowners uh, that there are normal farm practices that occur in this area. So they need to be aware and they need to be certain that uh, what they're getting into, they already know. Uh, those are normal. And as far as I'm considered, grain drying is a normal farm practice. Um, in this case, the, grain, the, the bins are located a fair distance away from the proposed severance um, lot. However, with that said, if, the, if uh, a sale does occur to that particular um, uh, lot with the house, uh, then any future purchaser would be made aware of that through the severance agreement that's listed on title. Councillor Cates. Thank you through you, Madam Mayor to Dan. Um, it's maybe not that pertinent here, but I'm, I'm a little bit mixed up in Typically when we see this, we have like a farmer severing off one piece of his property. Uh, how do we have, we have the right shelves here and then we have an estate. Um, how is it already divided if it's not different ownership? I'm confused on that part of it. When I look at the, uh, the drawing or the, the actual map, the little yellow box looks to be in the middle of a great big farm field. Is that owned by them? Uh, so through the chair, uh, and again, I do apologize for the not notification map that was sent out. It did not accurately reflect the actual boundaries of the property. Uh, so in terms of um, the estate property, uh, that is the entirety of the 204 acres, which includes the 10651 Gold Creek Drive as well as the 10723 Gold Creek Drive. Uh, the, the lands that you're referring to as the, uh, I apologize. Yeah, uh, the right hell last, uh, last name. That, so that's the neighboring landowners farmland, which is getting the access easement through the estate lands. That's correct. Okay. So they live nearby. They live, yeah, they live on the neighboring farm parcel to the east. Gotcha. And they just want to ensure their access. Uh, through the chair, yes, that's correct. Thank you. Anyone else? I have one quick question with regard, you were talking about gravel, Dan. Um, the responsibility for maintaining the road is whose? Uh, through the chair. So Generally speaking, the, the actual easement agreement will lay out whose responsibility it is in the future, but typically whoever the, uh, the owner of the easement is, is the one that maintains the easement. Okay, if there's nothing else, then uh, we have a motion before us that consent application B2 2021 of the Bazaar Memorick Barnett Professional Corporation on behalf of the Dire Estate in order to several, pardon me, sever a resident surplus to a farm operation as a result of consolidation on a lot with a frontage of 74.4 meters on Gold Creek Drive and an area of approximately 1.29 acres and the retained having a frontage of approximately 1,389 meters on Gold Creek Drive and an area and an area approximately 203.7 acres from a lot legally described as part of lots 10, 11, and 12, 
concession for North University of Middlesex Center, Middlesex County be granted, and that the consent B02 2021 be subject to the 18 conditions noted in the planning report, and that the consent applications B07 2022 in order to establish a shared access easement for an agricultural field access easement with the easement being located on a property legally described as part lots 1011 and 12 concession for north in the municipality of Middlesex Center, County of Middlesex be granted. And that the consent B07 2022 and the six plus one, that would be the access easement for a total of seven conditions noted in the planning report and further that the reasons for granting consent application B07-2021 and B07-2022 include that the, that the proposal is consistent with the provincial policy statement and the proposal conforms with the County of Middlesex official plan and the Middlesex Center o, uh, County official plan and subject to the conditions that the proposal would comply with the Middlesex Center comprehensive zoning bylaw. Um, so I'm going to call the motion on the consent um, number on the first one. Oh, yes, sir. Through the chair, would the chair like me to read back condition number seven, the exact wording as presented by the planner for the recommendation? I'd be happy to do that at this time. Yeah, you've got that. I do have that yeah, before me. That would be me. a really good idea. Thank you so much. And that wording was that the access easement be clearly marked and placed in a location that is readily traversable by the owners of part lot 11 concession for North to the satisfaction of the municipality and that the applicant be required to update the servient and tenement land titles, clearly defining the location of the access easement at the sole cost of the applicant. Thank you. Yeah, so I just read the consent and I'll ask the mover and seconder on that piece. Uh, Councillor Cates, Deputy Mayor Brennan, is anyone opposed? I don't see any, so that motion is carried. And then we have to do the rezoning uh, motion, which is that application for zoning bylaw amendment set BA uh, 4 2021 for the land known municipally as 10723 Gold Creek Drive to rezone severed lands from the agricultural A1 zone to the surplus residential SR zone and the retained lands from the agricultural A1 zone to the site specific agricultural no residence exception A3 zone be granted and that the implementing bylaw be forwarded to council for consideration once a deposited reference plan has been provided to the satisfaction of the municipality. And further that the meeting, uh, pardon me, that the public meetings adjourn at 7.57 p.m. and council can resume regular meeting. Could I have a mo motion please? Councillor Cates and uh, Deputy Mayor Brennan, is anyone opposed? Seeing none, then that is carried as well. Okay, thank you thank everyone you. who came tonight. And we'll move on to a notice of motion, item number 10. Uh, I will, first of all, ask to table this item. If I could have a mover and a seconder to do that. Uh, I'm tabling, can, oh, yes. Okay, go ahead, Councillor uh, Heffernan, a seconder. Thank you, Councillor, I mean, Deputy Mayor Brennan. Uh, so that motion has been tabled now. I'll let the Councillor Heffernan to speak to that motion. Yes, so um, as we're all aware, the price of the gas pumps has gone up substantially in the last little while. Um, in as much as municipal governments do not have any authority or input into taxes or regulations for gas and oil, it is still our obligation, I feel, to represent our constituents grassroots level and keep upper tier governments apprised of any major issues. The increase to cost for oil and gas is a major issue across the country. In rural areas particularly, residents often drive many kilometers to their workplace um, and there are no public transportations out in the rural areas. This could cost an additional up to an additional $5,000 per year. For example, if their vehicle uses about $100 uh, in gas per week, and that has almost doubled um, lately. And I think it did at some point and come back and forth. Um, that's a lot of, uh, that's a big bite out of an already tight budgets for those of low or modest income. 
Additionally, rural farmers and businesses operate big trucks and heavy equipment requiring expensive fuels. On top of that, many rural residents use oil for heating, which has also increased dramatically in price. The provincial government has reduced gas and fuel tax temporarily, but at this point, from what I've read, all the federal government is doing is subsidizing uh, costs for electric vehicle purchases, which are beyond the financial capability of many drivers. Anyway, um, I understand through our MP Leanne Rood that the federal conservatives have presented a bill to exempt carbon taxes for farmers. But I ask for your support and approval in supporting this fuel tax resolution aimed at the federal government to assist our rural residents overall and hopefully to relieve budget pressures for our low and moderate income households within Middlesex Centre and beyond. Thank you, Councillor Happenden. I'll, I'll look to the council members. Is there anyone who would like to comment, ask a question, clarification? Yes, Councillor Cates. Thank you. Through you, Madam Mayor, um, my guest to Council, Councillor Heffernan, um, it's certainly not that I don't support your thoughts on um, what you're doing here, but my concern is that the, I, I just don't know the right words to use, the carbon tax that's getting collected, et cetera, it comes back to us, if I'm not mistaken, for other things. So if we save it on this hand, then it's going to cost us on this hand, which at the end of the day, is that just not going to, instead of paying in your gas tank, you're going to pay it on your taxes or something. That's my uh, not very well worded uh, comments. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, anyone else? I don't see any comment. I guess uh, my comment kind of is on the same line. Um, I think it's why one thing is it's one thing to look at the tax pieces on the at the gas pump, but um, in terms of the uh, carbon tax inside, it's a different kind of process. That, in any case, I was thinking this is just two issues as opposed to one piece. Um, I would be more comfortable and ask uh, moving this and voting on it if we were to um, give consideration to eliminating the part that refers to elimination of carbon taxes. So if, um, I guess my, my, I would have to amend the motion and I would, uh, to do that, I would say that I'm happy with the, the wording to the top of paragraph, to the bottom of par paragraph two, but in paragraph three, I would suggest uh, that we uh, delete the part that talks us uh, refers to talks to the point of carbon taxes and begins, begins with the phrase as well as to give consideration to reduce carbon taxes. So, I guess, yes, sir. through the through the chair, thank you for that. So that is an amendment to the main motion, and if you have a seconder, we can consider that amended amendment now. Okay. Oh, we do have a mover and seconder. Okay. Okay, Deputy Mayor Brennan and Councillor Pitts. Through the chair, the amendment is now on the floor and that is what council is considering. So I, I guess I'll call a vote on that, uh, that amended motion. Oh, sorry, the amended, amended piece only. This is just to make sure that what we vote on ultimately will actually have uh, a different kind of wording from what we see in front of us. And then we'll call a vote on the reworded uh, if it is accepted. Okay, so I'll call a vote on the um, amended version of the document. So I didn't say that right. That is okay. <laughs> Through the chair, at this time, council is considering an, an amendment to the main motion to remove the following clause, as well as to give consideration to reduce or eliminate carbon taxes. So that's what's on the floor for council's consideration at this time, and that's what the chair is seeking comments or a vote on following any comments. Comments first, then. Any comments? Yes, Councillor Cates. So again, back to my concern of robbing Peter and PayPal and charge here and not charge there. Should this be something that we should actually maybe have staff, you know, defer to staff to review? Or uh, like, do we, should we know some outcome of this before we vote on this? 
uh, the Mr. Chair can't give it to staff to review, but this is a consideration that to uh, provide input and lobby the government to make a decision to an upper level of government. Um, so it is the council's purview to make a stance and perhaps forward the communications upwards to see if there's any action that and and I I get it that you know I'm not trying to download something onto staff and they have enough work to do etc. My concern is is that I'm going to vote for something that I don't really know the uh, uh, the result of them taking uh, away this money. Yeah, through the charity council case, it's basically what council have put on the floor for council consideration is in regards to. Uh, asking our other levels of government to just give consideration to Canadians about the cost of fuel. So it's as simple as that. So okay. to direct the staff, we can look into carbon taxes and their effects, but essentially all we're doing is just asking for upper level government to give consideration for the week when it comes to uh, taxes that are excised on gas. Okay, I feel more comfortable now that you say that. Thank you. My comment would be that the other thing is, it would be up, I mean, the timing, the range of the relief offered, all of that would be up to the government, at the level of government, which would be making the decision. It would, we're not asking for a certain amount. We're not asking, we're asking, please take a look at this to see if there's a temporary thing or, or given the circumstances, something, yeah. We're not telling them exactly what to do. We're asking for consideration. Okay, if there are no other questions. Um, okay, so we have the amended uh, wording in front of us. Um, I'm gonna read the whole thing just so everyone's clear, okay? Would you want to read it? Um, I can, however, through the chair. At this time, we have an amendment on the floor. We are voting on the amendment and then we will return to the main motion. So it is not in order to read the full main motion at this time. We have to vote on that. Yeah. But do I have to read the whole thing? Oh, no. Okay, no. so everyone's aware that everything as well as to give to the end of that sentence is removed from the document. We're all clear on that. All in favor of removing that phrase. Okay, everyone is agreed. So we now have an amended version in front of us. Now I can call a vote on the amended version. Those who are in favor of writing these letters as outlined uh, and asking for consideration all in favor of that, I'll call that vote now. And that is carried. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, help clerk. <laughs> All right, we can move now to correspondence. Uh, we have four items. Is there anything here anyone wants to comment on? I don't see any hands. Okay, I'll ask the, the Deputy Mayor to give us an update on County Council yesterday. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, KPMG can, uh, accountants were there for the audit of the county books. Uh, that was passed without any concerns. Uh, the county's in pretty good shape. Um, <clears throat> Blackline Consulting for Technology Service and Delivery Review and Strategic Planning for the IT department at the county at the cost of 79000 was passed. Uh, uh, early Childhood uh, Educational Bursary between the county and Banjar College um, for in, in the amount of $80,000 was passed uh, for um, students uh, to go uh, uh, and uh, in applied arts and technology and community studies and school access studies and regional delivery. So that was also passed. Um, uh, the county, uh, got a uh, grant of $50,000 to start establishing a permanent public transit program within the county. We already have the one uh, bus that runs through uh, Oxford County into uh, the city of London and one from Sarnia that uh, passes through Kaboga to um, into the city of London also. We're looking at trying to make that, uh, instead of a, of a year by year grant system, we uh, looking at trying to make it a permanent program and expand on it. Uh, the Warden's Golf Tournament raised $23,000 this year with $20,000 going to the Dorchester VON program and $3,000 going towards mental health. Um, 
the child care reduction program of the, between Middlesex County and the city of London received $25.4 million. And that in the course of three years is to reduce the licensed child care programs down to $10 a day per child in three years time. So that, that money is to be used to uh, get that program down to that. Uh, we approved the cleaning service for the paramedic services. Um, funding received for attainable, for attainable housing review from the federal government of $89,000 was uh, uh, granted. Um, we had a motion and re-voted on the farm size in the county official plan. Uh, it was at 40, it was uh, proposed to go to 20. Uh, that was reversed in itself back to 40 uh, hectares uh, for a, a farm size in the county official plan. 100 acres instead of 50 acres. It, it, it received, the 50 acres received two readings. On the third reading, there was an amendment made to reverse it back to 100 uh, acres and uh, subsequently, uh, uh, a weighted vote was taken and it was uh, put back to 100 acres. <coughs> um, insurance costs obviously have gone up by a couple hundred thousand dollars uh, this year. Uh, they've, uh, we passed an, an access agreement with Quadro and Middlesex Center and that was to do with the, the, the severance and, and uh, of the building at Eight Mile and Highbury, that's all part of that where Quadro is going. And that was those were the main topics. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Deputy Mayor Brennan. Um, there is nothing else. Other business? I don't see any. Then um, we have our bylaws, and the motion before us is that bylaws 2022, number 73 through number 77, listed on the July 20th, 2022 agenda, be adopted as printed. Mover, please. And seconder. <laughs> Councillor Scott and Deputy Mayor Brennan, thank you. Um, all in favor? And that is carried. And now to adjourn, um, the motion is that the Council for the Municipality of Middlesex Centre adjourns the July 20th, 2022 Council meeting at 8 11 p.m. Uh, Councillor Arts and Councillor Cates. All in favor? And that's it. Thank you, everyone.